All right. Welcome to another very special episode of Hack and Grow Rich. I'm Shaheen Shan with my co-host, Bart Baggett. Bart is a personal development coach and has been in this industry for quite some time and one of the most unique and extraordinary high-level thinkers that I know. Bart is a legend in the internet online marketing space as well as a number of other avenues and is an author of this Bart. Is the Secrets of the Rich and Happy. I love that title. Thank you, Shaheen. And if you guys don't know your other co-host, he is one of the most magical thinkers on the planet, one of a, currently the secret stealthy Amazon genius. And together we're going to see if we can hack our brains and our bodies and make you all a little richer by the end of this episode. I love that. And today we have a special guest. You guys are probably seeing him on the screen. Kelly Killa Carter or Dr. Kelly Carter. Kelly, welcome to the show. We're just going to unmute you there. Okay, there you go. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited. This should be fun. Yeah, we're super psyched. You're actually going to be the first guest on Hack and Grow Rich. Bart and I have been doing these long form chat formats for, I think Bart, we're on like episode six or seven now. It's been a lot of fun. It's been, been the highlight of my week for sure. And uh, picking up traction, our friends are texting us and getting emails and asking us to bring on cool people. And it's gonna be fun. So I'm glad you're listening. And if you're downloading or listening on all of the, the different stitchers and the different iTunes, I'm so glad to be a voice in your ear. Yeah, we're available on all the channels. So if you enjoy this podcast and want to hear more from us, we're available on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, you name it. Just put in Hack and Grow Rich. For me, if you want to check out one of my other podcasts, you can check out Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult, which is totally different than Hack and Grow Rich. And today, guys, I wanted to let you know that we've got a couple sponsors so Bart, why don't you go first? I have, I'm a huge fan of, of uh, books. And way back before Audible was purchased by Amazon, it was my go-to place for audiobooks because I'm a, you know, I go to the gym and I drive a lot and, and I consume massive amounts of psychotherapy books and psychology books and success books. And even one of my best-selling books called The Magic Question, you know, once it hit Audible, I've been getting royalties for eight or nine years. Like it has a life of its own in Audible. So if you guys aren't an Audible subscriber, jump on over to the uh, website, audible.com slash hack and grow rich. I think your first book is free and become a consumer of great audio content like Shaheen and I and Dr. Kelly. I love that. Yeah, you get a free 30 day trial. Now, do you read your own book? Yeah, I'm always the author. Um, but if you're a crappy speaker, I would not recommend it. Okay. Hire someone. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. I, dude, I love your voice. So I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out. I've, I've seen the paper book by, and the Kindle, but I haven't seen the audible, audible book. So I'm excited. I could listen to you while I'm working out. So that's, that's awesome. And guys today also, I wanted to share with you guys, I've had an amazing experience lately with Citibank and we've got a special link and a promotion for anybody who's on the hack and grow rich podcast. Citibank basically is giving away thousands of dollars just for depositing money with them. And today in banks, it's rare, but they combine that with excellent service and really good banking products. So I strongly recommend it. We have a special link where you can take advantage of City's several promotions. And for any of you guys who listen to this podcast and do open up a absolutely free Citibank personal savings or checking account, um, use the code that we provide below, and I will offer you 15 minutes uh, to talk about anything you want to with me. You can just reach out to me through the show notes on my contact information. It might take me just under 30 days to get back to you, but I will offer a free 15-minute consultation with anybody there. So guys, today our guest is somebody who I became familiar with a few years ago, and the way that we became familiar is really interesting. He was introduced to me by a mutual friend of ours, Ken Rutowski, who runs the organization Metal International and who's one of the most connected guys any of us know. We, he's like the male Oprah, we, we always say. And Ken told us that, you know, this guy, you know, Ken has very like instantaneous reactions to people. And when he met this guy, Kelly, 
he was he absolutely loved him and he thought he was an amazing guy he introduced him to me as a practitioner of bjj so i immediately you know when i hear people saying oh you know i'm a martial artist or i've done this i'm like oh and uh, you know i i always have a little bit of skepticism right especially in la right and and you know this kelly like everybody's like oh yeah i'm a black belt you're like in in what in what so there's a lot of people but when I learned, I, I asked two questions, right? I asked, who do, who do you train under and what's your rank? And when I learned that you are a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and who you trained under, I was like, whoa. And that, that brings us to the topic of our show today, which is actually discipline. And we're going to talk about discipline and duality. So some interesting things before I invite Kelly to talk. I'm actually going to share my screen a little bit. And I want us all to watch a little clip, which I think is fantastic. And Kelly didn't know that I'm going to show this clip today. So um, we're going to share it and hope that it optimizes well. Let's take a, a quick peek here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right, here we go. If knowledge is power, then Kelly Carter is pretty knowledgeable. He knows how to punch, he knows how to kick, and he knows how to wrestle. I'm a trained martial artist. I've been doing it all my life, and um, this is what I do. Carter also knows that his truck's been broken into twice recently, and everyone knows that can be very frustrating. And I'm thinking in my mind, if I could just catch those people doing that in the middle of this, I would just, let, they realize that they broke into the wrong car. And so when Carter, who's set to enter the ultimate fighting circuit this summer, walked out of a Sherman Oaks coffee shop Monday night and saw two men trying to break into his truck, well, the fight was on. First off, the man in the getaway so car. I, I told him to stop and got in front of the car. He wouldn't. I kicked the side of his car and put a dent in it. And then he's going. I threw my chai latte uh, in his face. He got away, but his... All right. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is Kelly Killa Carter. Now, to add on to that, what I want to share is the way we actually became friends is that I also uh, have been practicing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu nowhere near the level of Kelly Killa Carter. And I had an unfortunate incident with a higher belt who got a little upset that I had tapped him being a lower ranking belt and did something very unfortunate to my spine. And I was in pain for days to which Kelly said, yeah, you know, I, I was like, dude, has this ever happened to you? And he's like, why don't you just come over to my, uh, you know, studio, uh, you know, in my clinic and let me take care of you. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm like, you're a killer. What do you mean? And <laughs> Kelly was like, you know, just, just come down. And I was like, okay. You know, and, and Bart, you and I talk about this a lot, how, you know, a strong believer in science and science-based medicine. Um, but sometimes it just makes sense to suspend judgment. So I suspended judgment. I went to Kelly's studio and it was, you know, beautiful and clean. And he did this incredible system of like Eastern medicine meets Western physical therapy meets stretching. And dude, when I, wa when I walked in, I was in some of the deepest pain I've ever had in my spine, my neck, my back. When I left, it was like slightly tender. I could have gone to jujitsu. He in fact said, oh, are you gonna roll today? I was like, yeah, maybe not a good, maybe a good idea to take a couple days off, but he fixed me. So, so Kelly, what is this voodoo that you do? <laughs> the voodoo that I do? Uh, well, that, what we did there was, um, you know, you, when you do, it's just like mar mixed martial arts or whatever you're doing. I've been doing the healing arts for since the early nineties. And so it's a mix of a lot of different things, but primarily that was active isolated stretching and, um, and some Gua Sha, which is from Chinese medicine. And then I had the secret potion, um, uh, which I think I, I got from one of our metal brothers, uh, which was that, that Quanta. And uh, that, that was, then put that all together and then well, voila, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, there's, you know, the body can heal itself, you know, you just, uh, 
just got to point it in the right direction. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit more. I think this is interesting. And Bart, I don't know what your thought is about this, but one of the things that I think is so interesting about you, and I think, you know, especially in a time where everything has been polarized and you and I talk about this a lot, Kelly, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and when everything's been politicized and polarized and you're either this or that, or you're left or right, or, you know, like no one's allowed to have an opinion. You got to be on one side of the polarization. It reminds me about duality and kind of like the intricacies of life and how complex we all are. And when I look at you, I see somebody who's very self-realized in a lot of ways and self-reflective. Bart and I talked about that a lot on previous shows, the importance of, of being self-reflective. Mm-hmm. But you know, I see you as somebody that's, that's, that's really living this duality. On one end, you're a guy that you don't want to piss off you know, drunk at a bar. And on the other end, you're this amazing healer. How's that work? Um, well, I, you know, that's all relative, right? Everything's relative, what levels we are about everything. But, you know, I, I always looked at it as just one and the same because um, uh, I lived in this martial arts academy in Chicago uh, when I was going to school there. I was going to Columbia College there for a while. And, and so they had this, uh, this martial arts academy and my teacher there, uh, my teacher Kimball was, uh, was, was uh, studying acupuncture at the same time too. He was going to acupuncture school. And so I just figured, oh, well, you know, I studied Tai Chi, uh, Kung Fu, um, all this. And then you go into the healing arts too. I just looked at it as one and the same. And then I studied more and I, I realized that like the Shaolin, right? The Shaolin's they all study herbalism. They study some type of healing art and that's been forever. So if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, do hard training, I mean, your body's not going to last if you don't do some type of healing modality, some type of recovery work to do that. It's got to be just as well balanced. You know, you've got to, you've got to do stuff that's going to really heal you along the way. Uh, Iron fist stuff, right? I know friends of mine do iron fist work. It's like they're hitting concrete bags as hard as they can, but they had to work their way up to it, but they used herbs on their hands, the Da Jiao and stuff to, to really heal them and on the way to where they could actually work up to be able to go to that level. The same thing with jujitsu, you know, you, the stretching is so, um, uh, is so important to, to follow that type of, this type of stretching like I do is very thorough. Uh, and I always was healing myself along the way like that so that I could keep myself out of trouble. It didn't, you know, injuries happen. And I've had a, like some pretty gnarly injuries uh, from enduring jujitsu. But as far as healing and fighting, I just think it should go along with each other. If you're going to train martial arts, you should train some type of healing art along with that. It just makes sense to me. No, you probably didn't know this, but my, my martial arts training uh, got up to about a blue belt in Shaolin Kung Fu. And um, I haven't trained in a while, so I definitely could take neither one of you at this very moment. But yeah. my master, we used to have this ongoing uh, conflict because he was Korean. And Korean respect is one of the ultimate values. And I would call him master in the studio and then doctor when he was giving me Chinese herbs. And he would always be like, no, I'm not your doctor, I'm your master. And I'm like, yeah, but you're my doctor here, my master. Like for a white guy, it just made sense that when we're in the medical, he's the doctor. But once you had that a role of that apprentice or that master student, it was a different level of respect. But I went there for martial arts training, and I left a huge believer in Chinese medicine. And I've always kind of balanced the Western with the Eastern with the acupuncture for, for since I was 20 years old. And oh. so for me, uh, it's just normal to approach the world as one big planet and say, where in the world has people solved these problems? Let's go find out what they're doing. And Ooh. unfortunately, if you grew up in a small town in the Southwest, you may never have heard of uh, a movie called 3000 Needles or acupuncture or anything like that, where, you know, this is just your bread and butter. It's just normal to you. People walk out healed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the, the body. I mean, it's, it's got a lot of experience, right? more experienced than any other acupuncture itself in herbology, more, more, uh, more experience in years than any other healing art in the world and documented healing arts in the world. All tribes and all societies, they always have their doctors. 
but boy, they really have down for a very long time. And in, that's how they even figured, well, the one story, who knows, it was so long ago, right? That they even figured out acupuncture. Uh, the story that I was given in school was that uh, a soldier had gotten shot with an arrow. He goes to see a medic. They have medics that would, you know, heal their wounds. And uh, he got shot right through near his thumb, right? And a lot of people know this point, it's LI4 Hey Goo or the Great Pain Eliminator is what it's called, but it's known for headaches. People are like, oh yeah, squeeze, squeeze right here so that you uh, can take away your headache. So this soldier had gotten shot there and he realized, oh wow, my he had chronic headaches and they went away. They went away after him getting shot by the arrow in that particular point. Uh, and so they started, they put two and two together and like, hmm, let's check this out. And so I don't know if you like rammed arrows in other parts of his body or not, but they, um, they go and they, they, uh, they, they started doing the math on it. And, we'll, and then all of a sudden you got these hundreds of points all over the body and uh, they have very designated prescriptions. And uh, so that's, that's the story where it came from. If it's not, it's a pretty good story though. Yeah. I, I like that. We, Bart and I have talked about this before, you know, it's funny cause you know, like chiropractic, for example, you know, there's a lot of people believe that chiropractic is just straight quackery. There's a lot of people who believe that acupuncture, acupressure is just completely bogus. And I've, I've seen TV shows, documentaries where at the end of it, you're like, yeah, it's totally bogus, but then you get a pain or you get an injury and something happens and they they've got no cure for you. And then you go to someone who's practicing this stuff and sometimes, not always, it works. So mm -hmm. how do you argue with that? How, do you, how, how does the most scientific mind in the world argue with, it works for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's weird. You know, I work with a lot of, got a really great practice down here in uh, Metairie by New Orleans here. And um and I've worked with some really great doctors, uh, functional medical doctors, uh, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, uh, chiropractors. We all work as a team. And, and we're like, uh, I just, um, I told an uh, orthopedic surgeon the other day, I said, I don't think this fella should, this, this patient that we're both working on, I said, I don't think this fella should be getting these injections. They were going to give him injections in his back because pain in his back was so bad. I go, the first day he came and did, got acupuncture, he was in an eight pain level out of a 10. He left a zero, wow. right? He left at a zero that day. He came back with a six, but then, it, then he left with a zero again. And now it's down to like a three. And that's just after three treatments or so. I go, I think that that would be, maybe it may not help the process. He goes, oh, let's not do it. He totally called it off. Didn't even question it. I said, man, if that's what the results we're getting, that's what we're going to do. And so a Western we went, doctor, someone with MD after their name. Oh yeah. That's an orthopedic surgeon. Oh yeah. And this is, we're in New Orleans. We're not in, in Los Angeles where it's acupuncture's primary care in California. So it's much more accepted in the hospitals and everything here. We just got a great group of dudes, you wow. know, and ladies that are, are really great doctors that stick to their Hippocratic oath and say, we're here to get these people better, you know? So, so, so let's backtrack a little bit. So let's go from healing to hurting. So you were approached by Dana White, the founder of UFC, to fight as Kelly the Killer Carter in a UFC fight. Tell us a little bit about what happened there. Uh, well, uh, you know, it was very interesting. I, I had been um, training. That's, one reason, that's the reason I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, it was just after 9-11, and uh, Tito Ortiz had invited me to come and train with them. Started training with those guys. It was too far to drive from Venice. Uh, time went on. A lot of stuff happened in between there. Um, and then I, uh, as far as my path of my life, I had, um, I was in the film industry a lot. I worked with a lot of film people. And then uh, things kind of redirected. And I didn't, I'm like, oh, I, I kind of wanted to get in the film industry. And like, oh, wow, I don't have to get punched in the face to get in the film industry because it was already happening for me in other ways. And then I went back again and started training to fight really seriously. So I started training um, heavy duty. 
you know, I had incredible coaches, Benny the Jet Yukides, my striking coach, Majid Reese, Majid Reese, who is his protege. We all worked together. Um, my striking was going to a whole different level. And, um, and so I go and uh, I was on my way to my boxing lesson with Majid that day. And uh, these guys tried to break in my truck, you know, the, the clip shows. And um, guy tried to stab me, you know, all this stuff, right? And uh, so it was a big deal. They called me the vigilante and stuff. It was on uh, a show, but it was like, I just knew that like, I, I put on a martial arts clinic. I was very proud of myself. And just because I was very calm, I tried not to hurt the fella either. I wasn't trying to hurt him. I was just trying to submit him. And although he tried to stab me and everything, I got very calm. And it was like, it was like, Kempo meets MMA and a little bit of Tai Chi sprinkled in there, disarmed him, choked him out, sent him to the hospital nicely in an ambulance. And so he, um, and, and I was really, really working so hard not to, to, to hurt him, but just, just naturally that way. Anyway, Adam, it got made national news. Uh, Adam Carolla just took over Howard Stern's spot on his radio show, right? Big show in Los Angeles and uh cbs and i believe radio and so he um so he had interviewed me on there called me a vigilante and everything and we're just talking about it you know and i'm so you know, fun and everything and then dana white calls in you know out of the blue i had no idea dana white calls in on the um on the show and uh and asked me a few questions about myself and uh, and I actually stayed super calm about it. I was just like, wow, this is a pretty awesome opportunity. I wasn't spitting nickels. He goes, you don't sound that excited about it. Because he, he asked me, he goes, would you like to be on the Ultimate Fighter? And I'm like, I go, yeah, I think that'd be pretty cool. You know, I think that'd be great. And uh, so anyway, he invited me on the Ultimate Fighter. I had this invitation for it. And uh, so they started courting me um, through this over the next two years, giving me tickets, like great seats and tickets. He said, you know, and I tell you, Dana was so cool to me. And uh, I would go there and I, what happened too is after, the, after that um, had happened, right? Two weeks later, after he had invited me onto the Ultimate Fighter, I, I, um, I was training, I broke my ankle oh. and I had surgery. And so I remember going to one of the fights and I'm on crutches now and I went down to see him and, uh, cause he, and he goes, uh, I go, hey, uh, Dana, I, I introduced, that's the first time we met face to face. And I said, you know, I, I, I reminded him of the show and everything. And I said, uh, man, I've, I've jacked up my ankle, man. I go, he goes, he goes, uh, it's okay, man. He goes, it'll get better. He goes, uh, he goes, make sure whenever you come to these, he goes, he goes, make sure you come and talk to me. Cause I'm busy. I got a lot of people to talk to. I'll forget, you know, and he goes, make sure you're always in my face about it. And so they kept giving me tickets and everything. And, and, uh, like, so I could come and, you know, be, have my presence there and everything so cool to me and then um and then i go it's two years later still hadn't had my weight class right it's i was i would have done 205 which those guys are so much bigger than me but i'd have done 205 or 185 they're much taller and, and you know tito ortiz but they're, they're very large guys and um so i would uh so then i go in they said well, we need to see another fight we need to see a fight so i had this great fight lined up in florida and uh, it was going to be a, you know, for that time, you know, 5,000 seat venue, it's televised. This is like a really nice show to go to. Uh, the guy was 6'2". He was 205 fighter. Um, he actually was 6'6". Six, six. Uh, I met him later. He was enormous. He was a huge dude. And um, and so uh, it was really, really interesting. My coach said that he was 6'2". And uh, I go, what a nice, you know, to know that. But um, <laughs> and uh, those long guys, you know, you don't underestimate those guys at all. And uh, so um, we go and uh, I go to, um, uh, to do that fight. I'm training for it. It's a month out, fall off my bicycle on concrete and just missed my, the fire hydrant with my head and uh, just blew my back out. Like I blew a disc out and a uh, nine millimeter bulge tore my labrum in my hip. It was already a bit injured. I it just couldn't recover from it. I had to pull out of that fight. And that took me out for four years. Wow. It took me out for four years of training. I couldn't train at all. And um, so I kind of look at it. I look back and I'm like, um, you know, it was, it was already, 
I was training at that time so hardcore, like at Benny's. Every Saturday, we basically did a smoker. We're going to the knockout. Really top top level UFC guys in there. Uh, one in particular is one of my sparring partners, and we really we were going to 110 percent. Right, smart guys now don't do that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Robbie Lawler did never did that. Cowboy never did that. And they're like they like they always ask Robbie. It's like how did you have such a long career? It's like, I didn't let people hit me in the head. So, so let me, let me carry on on that note, because this really is, you know, a, a podcast for personal development and accelerating and hacking human nature. And that's kind of what Bart and I have been focused on for these last episodes. So you just explained a, a physical trauma, two physical traumas that maybe at that point you're like, yeah, you know, maybe this isn't, you know, it wasn't meant to be, but how do you, you're a pretty stoic guy. Every time I've seen you, that's one of the things I noticed about you have a very grounded, just general vibe or energy about you. And you're very stoic. It seems like nothing can throw you off your game. How do you do that? What's, what's the mindset and how, how would you recommend to our viewers and listeners to be able to achieve that same kind of mindset? Well, um, it's interesting, you know, when people have different looks on you, cause I'm like, wow, that's interesting that you, that you see that. Cause I, I, um, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you, uh, you're very perceptive in many ways. And uh, I have a lot of respect for you. So that makes me feel good. Um, uh, you know, I, I do Tai Chi regularly and it's a moving, med you know, moving meditation. And, uh, uh, that's what, that's what keeps me calm most of the time. Cause I, I was just going to say too, it's like, if the ADHD kicks in, just say, Hey, just relax a little bit, Calicotta. you know? And so, cause that'll, that'll take over. And so, so I've done a lot of that to help calm myself down and be able to be centered and always be okay in situations, be calm, cool and collected, uh, that way, you know, that's, that's the main thing that I do. And then especially just, you know, just having a healthy lifestyle and eating and not eating certain things. I, I, uh, I'm even calmer now just because I, I stopped drinking coffee as well and stopped drinking and caffeine made a huge difference for me. Um, other people are fine with it, but not so much for myself, but, uh, it's just, it's, and it's a long time of doing it too, you know, and really dealing with your, um, it's not this tight sheet. It's like when I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Tai Chi for treating anxiety. And so I learned a lot about myself through that um, and a lot about uh, life in general through that. And I developed a, um, a, uh, a way to intentionally set your, to touch your, to, to do Tai Chi intentionally. So I really set an intention, like a real concrete intention. I write it down. I connect into an emotion that. Like what? Was, like, tell us what the intention would be. Uh, before I did an, I said, I did one right before I did the show before I came on with you guys. And I said, uh, I'm owning my powerful power, feeling calm, cool, and collected. Okay. I like that. So you want to be, see, I always see you as a guy that's calm, cool, and collected, but you want to be more calm, cool, and collected. So what you do is you, you practice a little bit of Tai Chi before. I do it, but I meditated into, I actually like drive the intention into my being. There's a whole process that I developed. It was a combination between lifeline technique. My buddy, Dr. Darren Weissman developed uh, the lifeline technique and Tai Chi and a few other things. And then I just kind of put the chocolate and the peanut butter with that. And it ends up like really, it's so, it's pretty intense, very intense meditation. And you can put it in like that. It's like, it's like Tony Robbins calls, he doesn't call them intentions. He calls them incantations. You know, you're like casting a spell on yourself in a real positive way and reprogramming your, your brain. And then I enter neuroplasticity into that when I do it over a long time. So I have people do it about myself over about 40 days, 40 to 60 days, and you can really reprogram bad habits, old uh, habits, other behavioral patterns that you're not, um, that you want to change. And uh, most science says around that time, there's different, some of them say 21 days, but um, most of the studies that I read is around actually 40, 60 days to, to change that. So I'll drive that intention and just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it as you're doing that Tai Chi, which then puts you into the relaxation response 
or that alpha brainwave state. And so in that conscious state, you can really make things happen that way. And your body can really accept that. And then the, the more often you do it and do it steadily like that and repeat that, your mind's like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm not supposed to be in fight or flight. I'm supposed to be like calm, cool, and collected. Well, you, know, Kelly, be- you, you just described a process that uh, is remarkable because you're talking about neuroplasticity, affirmations, belief systems, and then you're anchoring it into the state, like the Tony Robbins anchoring. And mm-hmm. as a fan of meditation, I always thought there's got to be something more than just sitting like a monk thinking. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, when you're having these active physical actions, you're not really balanced. I, I love what you're doing. Is that something that you've put into a video or a training program or a book, or we have to come to New Orleans to hang out with you? <laughs> well, I, I am. I, I have been writing a book over, I've been writing it for quite some time, and it's based off of my dissertation. And uh, I wrote the bulk of it over the lockdowns. Um, and so I, uh, I took that time to, 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 to finish, pro- to get a project going and finish. Actually, uh, Shaheen has helped me a lot just in, because he's written, what, are you on eight books now? Yeah, um, I think throughout my history, yeah. <laughs> it's quite impressive. So uh, just to knock this first one out, I've got a lot of content made, so I have put it together as a program. And I teach my private, uh, my patients this as well. Um, so, yeah, it's really helpful. Yeah, we'll, we'll include some notes for you guys, um, show notes to how to get a hold of Dr. Kelly, and he'll let us know more about this. So if you guys are in Louisiana, definitely go see him and get on his mailing list. Um, and I know he does seminars from time to time. But so let's let's move back into your martial arts training, specifically Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So for you guys who don't know, in many martial arts, you can move up the ranks fairly quickly. They've got a lot of belts. Like I think, what is it, Kelly? Like uh, Taekwondo has like almost, is it is it dozen or dozens or depending on the teacher, how many belts do they have? I think they invent them uh, and come up with new colors and stuff uh, every <laughs> year and more stripes and everything because it's, it's quite a feat for each belt level. So... But you can get them in about three years. You can get in about, you can get black belt in three years from Taekwondo. When you're around 10, 11 years old, you know, so you're, you know, that's when you're just, you're just a sponge then. So it, you know, it all makes sense. Yeah. Or karate is, I think, you know, four years is the quickest you can get it, right? Uh, With Legitimate karate schools are, I mean, like legitimate, even like Kempo schools around 10 years. 10 years. Okay. Yeah. But Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There's only four or five belts, right? Uh, yep. White, blue, brown, black, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and red. And my kids always ask me, how do you get a red belt? And I say, your last name's got to be Gracie or Machado. That's how, you, <laughs> that's how you get a red belt, kid. I believe they have the coral belt, too. I, I think that comes before the red belt. I think, uh, like, Hegan's a coral has a coral belt. I think that's what he wears. Oh, right, yeah. So my, those, are, my, those are for... Right. Those are for people who've contributed to the culture and like, you know, that's a whole like another level. But so like, it's not unusual from what I've seen for people to go from in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, BJJ from white belt to black belt for it to take 20 plus years. Oh yeah. It, it took me from when I started Jiu Jitsu, I, I was second degree black belt in Kempo and our, our Kempo was, we wrestled and we did, it was a mixed martial arts schools and early, like we we're quite innovative in Chicago with that. And we were tied with the Degerberg Academy as well. And we, we, um, they were very, very well respected and they were way ahead of, of people doing jujitsu. Um, uh, they were, I, I went to the school one day and they're wrestling with their geese on the ground. I'm like, why, why do you do that? And I had no idea. It's like, so far be, before that, but um, yeah, the uh, the here the ADHD is kicking in. So, uh, did you say um, so when we uh, when you um, we, you were just commenting on how long it takes to get a Brazilian oh yeah to black belt as opposed to other arts that goes, you might get a I, I took uh, it. I, I started I think in '96, yep. and I think it took me 22 years. And because I had so many interruptions, you know, and I'd already done, been doing a bunch of other stuff. So I, I got, I was very hardcore up to my purple belt with, uh, I got my purple from Pablo Popovich, George Popovich, who's a hall of, you know, Pop, Pablo's a hall of famer 
and his dad was uh, was a very close coach of mine. And so then I got into MMA when I moved to LA. So then you're not going up the, the ranking systems. You know, I did mostly no gi. Uh, I was I trained with Eddie Bravo for three and a half years, you know, doing just straight no gi. Um, so I didn't really climb up those ranks. Then I went back around and got back into the ranking system. And then I had, you know, probably six, seven years of that. I was solid. I was injured. Wow. Yeah. I mm. didn't know you trained with Eddie Bravo. I mean, he's, he's legendary in that, you know, I mean, I don't think there's anybody that's innovated as much on a, on a fairly traditional martial oh, art as, yeah. as he has. I mean, he's his twister, his move, the, the moves yeah. that he developed mm -hmm. so unconventional. And I think it's yeah. so much on the other side of like people like Hicks and Gracie, who's about the pure jujitsu. And, you know, as he's getting older, he's, he's, you know, developing much more of his like invisible jujitsu and is very much about the purity. And even, you know, people like uh, Crone Gracie, who's like a very strict, you know, the very formatted, you know, Crone, Crone is also a judokai. He's a, a black belt in judo. So, you know, he's, he's a lot more traditional in, in his, you know, skill set for jujitsu, but Eddie Bravo, you know, he threw it all out the window, got rid of the geese and then just started innovating, which is pretty unique, right? He really is a, a hacker of Brazilian jujitsu. He is. He really is, man. You know, it's like, you don't realize it. When I actually, when I first, first heard it, Eddie, I was, um, I was at John Jock Machado's. I was training with, with John Jocks and I, I was, uh, I talked to, to Joe Rogan there and Joe was still training with him in the gi. And he goes, and I told him what I was doing, my aspirations were to fight MMA and everything. He, was, and he, he turned me on to Eddie Bravo and they're, you know, best buddies or whatever. And I'm like, and he, um, and so uh, I, I went over there and yeah, Eddie is like, he is an innovator. He, like he's very, very creative. And uh, it, it just like does not, he doesn't, he does, he gives no fucks at all. He just does his thing. He's a real artist, you know, with this. And um and he's uh, he's really developed uh, so much, and it's like the stuff he come up with. I was just hilarious, you it's know. Memes, at least, right? Okay, so so Kelly, the name of the show is Hack and Grow Rich. So why don't we give the listeners, and by we I mean you, mm -hmm. three things that they should keep in mind if they are ever out in a similar situation to yours and have the potential of getting attacked. And by the way, folks, never, you know, confront an assailant who's got any kind of weapon or no weapon otherwise. You know, Kelly is, is a lifetime martial artist and trained at this. So I just want to mention to everybody who's listening and, and watching this, don't try your luck. But, but you can throw the latte. That is totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a pumpkin latte, right? I hear that has special powers. But so Kelly, three hacks that people with little or no martial arts experience can use to keep themselves safe and get out of a hairy situation like you were in being attacked by two guys with screwdrivers and heaven knows what else. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing, your awareness is everything. Paying attention to, I'm, I'm hyper vigilant. I'm super hyper vigilant. Right. And uh, so I it's probably, I get along with, with, roll us so well because we're both that way you're always kind of standing for danger um so you i i think i just you actually have that but you can i'd be you're always aware don't put yourself in situations that that are that are gonna endanger you i was back there by myself in a parking lot so i don't really care i go back i i i'm just i'm three blocks from bourbon street right here i mean there's just some there's a lot of stuff going on here too so it's like you you um, always be aware of your surroundings, right? Um, in that situation, if the guy was going to actually stab you, uh, probably just run and just go the other way, right? It's probably the best idea. Um, the only reason I, I gave him three chances to leave um, or else I would not have engaged with him. I wouldn't have engaged with him. Um, the only reason I did is he just kept like, he took my computer out. I said, get the F away from my truck. He kept running, drops it. He, he, I go, if he would have got up and ran away and left the computer there, I would have let him run. I wouldn't have chased him. 
if uh, if but he picks it up like he stoops over and picks it up. I go, I'm sorry, I've given you this is your third 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 times a charm here. Three strikes, you're out. And then I kicked him because he bent over and touched it. I had to to take him out. And so um, so that's that's why I engage. Otherwise, I let him go. There's no reason I wanted to 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 deal with it uh, because be of aware. Mm -hmm. Run away if you can. And what would the third and final hack for somebody who's got, who's not like you, who's, you know, not a trained martial artist like you. I know you've trained with police officers and former military and high level jujitsu black belts. You've trained with the Gracies and the Machados and all this. We're talking about somebody who has little or no training and they're in a situation where they're approached with this kind of danger. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the thing is, is the preparation is where it's at. You know, you got to be prepared. Um, it's like, it's how can you tell someone, oh, just do this, just do that. Uh, have a pen in your hand and stab them. It's like, no, it's like, no, uh, train. So I would say train, train and prepare yourself, you know, and uh, you don't have to, you don't have to be a fanatic about it and, and compete and everything, but train, do something that's going to prepare you for that. Even like Krav Maga, you know, great for just straight self-defense, you know, um, and, uh, and go from there. But I think everybody should learn some martial art and learn it uh, and, and be, be proficient at it enough to where you can take care of yourself. Shaheen, a story popped into my head when, when you're asking that question mm -hmm. is when we were in Shaolin and we would fight seven or eight assailants, the only way to do that is to put one of them in front of the other. So you're never really fighting five assailants. Mm -hmm. You're moving around and backing up. So you're really only fighting one. And mm -hmm. I thought that was such a valuable tool because people see bar fights in movies and they want to get in the middle of the circle, which yeah. is the worst idea ever. Oh no! You, know, you want to move around. And, and uh, Kelly, I was walking down Tennessee and with a girl and I kept moving her on different parts of the sidewalk and she was like why do you keep doing that and i'm like because there's four guys behind us and there's two guys over there and we're in a dark street corner would you just listen to me and she was like oh i didn't even notice that because i just wanted to navigate so that i didn't end up in an alley with four kids behind me and so yeah. what i did is i just pulled them back we stood in the atm they walked by she thought i was crazy but it was just that awareness you're talking about of going hey there's five guys there and and this is just safer to not get yourself in that in that context in the first place. Is that about right? It's, it's a great thinking and the stacking is important, but then again, you trained for that. Stacking right. is locking people up in a row and, uh, and getting them to get, so they're walking over themselves. Then you're only fighting one person. It's like 300, they funneled them down through that skinny uh, and route. And you kick the first one just right, it's like a bowling pin. It'll knock all 10 of them down, I've read. Yeah. You know, I, I just watched uh, a Devin Seagal movie, Steven Seagal movie, and he'd do that all the time. Those are so fun to watch. You know, back in the day. Uh, but he, but you know, that also like that awareness, like a woman, right? They tell people all the time. It's like, don't go to your car, then look in your purse and get your keys and fumble through like that. Right. Have the keys out. You walk around your car, all that stuff, you know, just little stuff like that could really make a big difference. You know, look under your car. Uh, there was a big thing going around for a while where guys were, were straight razoring um, people's Achilles tendons. God. They'd hide underneath their car. What? They'd hide underneath their car and they'd slice their Achilles tendon and the person just collapses. Whoa. Right? That's all they do to them, but then they steal their car and whatever else they wanted to, you know? So it's like just like being aware of that all the time. And I used to do that. I was so fanatical about found weaponry. And I, I mean, I, I used to test myself all the time. I'd walk behind in dark alleys in China at three in the morning in uh, Guangzhou. And I, I couldn't sleep. I was there training and I'd just go walk and just like, you know, and I kind of, you don't want to ask things to happen, but I certainly was always like, I would always be hyper aware of like, what can I do here and stuff and put myself a little bit to the test like that. Probably not super smart, but um, <laughs> they've done a few things that aren't that uh, brilliant. So, um, but I learned from them. So, and I'm still here pretty unscathed. Sure. That sounds really hairy. I mean, if someone's hiding under cars 
I would say you, sir, are bad at crime. That sounds like a terrible, like, what is the rate of success of doing that, sir? If you have to hide under somebody's car, cut their ligaments in order to get a person, you, sir, are unqualified to commit crime. Please find <laughs> another job. You are bad at crime. If you are doing that, there's so many easier crimes. Please pick a better crime. There's a lot of them. Just Google. We've got Google, sir. Yeah. They got to get more creative. That's just more creative. That's just Dean. (laughs) So, okay. So Bart and Kelly, which brings me to our final topic as we're approaching our last few minutes of the show. And then at the end, we will tell you guys how to get a hold of Dr. Kelly and hopefully uh, he will be on the show again, and maybe we could have him show us some techniques, um, both of healing and hurting, so we can we can learn that duality. But the topic of the show was originally discipline, and I feel like we're 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 coming full circle back to that, guys. So, you know, to be a martial artist, to spend the twenty plus years on one art, and you know, who knows how many other years you've spent on all these other arts requires discipline. Tell us about your discipline and personally, what discipline means to you. Yeah, that's a good, it's such a good and very, how it would have to have a very layered answer. My personal experience is, is that I had challenges with discipline so much. And they're always about, oh, do martial arts. It gives you self-discipline. And I felt like I never, I, I felt like I had it at times, but not uh, like just so like laser focused like that. Um, but it's just, it's, but what I found and through wor- years of working on it. And um, I, I mean, I, I this will this will plug into what you're saying, but I, late in life, I get diagnosed with ADHD. Right. I'd re- I recognized from my doctoral study. And so um, so what I did when I realized that, wow, I go, I started researching. And I said, wow, this explains my whole life. Mm. You know? And so but I also was inspired because there's a whole list of all these icons through the years that were all ADHD. You sure. know, you know, Michael sure. Jordan to Van Gogh to, to Albert Einstein. But I'm just like, I go, wow, there's got to be good things about this. So so what I did is I. Um, is I decided to do the George Costanza method, which I came, I came up with that idea from Seinfeld. And so when George Costanza, uh, they said, uh, you know, he was really bad with women and said, and so they go, oh, go talk to that girl she's looking at. He goes, ah, oh, no, you know, no, George, just do the opposite of what you would normally do, the complete opposite. And so, cause what you do never works. So anyway, I did that with that. And so I did the complete opposite of what I normally would do and then scored 4.0s and, and wrote uh, like really noted papers in my dissertation. So the same thing I did with martial arts is I really focused and cranked down, you know, the last few years um, with Renato, uh, he was he was so supportive of me. Uh, you know, we were doing privates every week. He was grooming me to get to really get to the, that black level. And uh, I was just so laser focused on that was consistency. I made myself, I had a routine. Uh, that's, I saw Ken all the time uh, at the, um, Rutowski at, at the, uh, at, uh, at uh, the, the gym all the time at that, uh, um, in LA. Right. And I'd go there all the time. And I mean, I was there, the reason I was there is warming up for jujitsu. So I actually did an hour, hour and a half of warm up before I'd even go to class. You know, and I, that's stretching and, and preparing and, and getting my mindset for it. Cause I'm like, I don't want to get injured again. Cause I had some gnarly injuries and I didn't want to go back there again. And I came and I tell you that, that discipline, consistency, discipline, always focusing on that, um, really helped me and took me through that. And I was feeling absolutely no pain. I wasn't even sore. Like I just really, like, I really was the best few years I ever had in jujitsu were the last three years in LA um, with Renato school at street sports. And how does that come back to discipline? What's what, what would your takeaway be in these last minutes for somebody who looks at you, who admires you, who would be like, dude, I want to achieve some of the things that he's achieved. How does, 
how can they use discipline to get them there? I loved your first hack. Your first hack is if what you're doing doesn't work, try doing the opposite of that and see if that works. Because that could be golden in and of itself. I see Bart smiling because I think he, he'd be uh, a proponent of that system. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I think the consistency and perseverance and keep your eye on that prize, but also at the same time, keeping yourself balanced in um, all aspects of your life during that. It's a juggling act. You know, it really is. And I, I mean, I literally, I don't know if I, I may have showed you videos or something, but I, I literally juggle uh, as part of my warm up and part of my training. I'll balance on a Swiss ball and my knees and I'll juggle several different ways. And I, I just, and this for concentration, for jujitsu, um, the concentration uh, itself helped me in my game itself of jujitsu because I play hands a lot. It really would help me to stay focused, but that is what helped me to stay focused and keep my discipline for that in all aspects of my life. As just the training itself really helped me to do that. So just do the training, just go to the gym, Go do the training and be consistent about it. Um, that's that's uh, how I see it. Is that is that answering your question? Does that sound like a good um, way There's to? There's no uh, bad answer. It's just your answer. Um, we could have had a, a more brevity answer, yes, but it's a fine answer. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned Shaheen, the, the topic really unlocks an entire a couple of years of my research, and, and really two things come up to me is just like with a company, what's get measured gets improved so if you're not measuring it and you're not tracking it then you don't really have the confrontation of you not doing it and so yeah. when dr carter's like go to the gym if you're tracking it even on a small app or a spreadsheet or something where you get a dopamine hit for the habits that you want to encourage that to me is the secret of changing habits and if you look at people's lifetimes it's those small habits over years that really move the needle and so we developed a whole program called Life Designed by Prism, and it was about creating small dopamines, a little one or a two, or maybe a little, a little, just something that was positive reinforcement. Because you know what? Your wives and kids, they're not going to cheer you on for going to the gym. They're not going to cheer you on for winning a big contract. All they want is a hug. So, yeah. so what you need is to find some kind of self system that makes like, yeah, I got 30 points today. Like I'm on target. And after about six months of making 30, 40 points on whatever, you know, having a smoothie or going to the gym, you're like, yeah, yeah my life is better now. And, and so it's a, it's a really more complicated answer, but, but really hacking the brain, Shaheen, creating dopamine hits, creating positive reinforcement for those things like getting up at 530 and going to the gym. To me, that's a key to really breaking an old habit. If the George Costanza thing doesn't work for you. <laughs> I love, I love that Bart, And, uh, especially the dopamine release, cause that is something that I, I was challenged with is not getting that dopamine release for like some things that need to get done, busy work. Right. So then I started programming myself to, and associating that with things that did give me a dopamine release and then transferred it over to stuff that I don't like doing. <laughs> So is that similar to what you guys were doing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have kids, you can give them a dollar to do their chores, but you, who's going to give you a dollar? So it's got to be a point or a system or something where you're just giving yourself that little bit of half on the back, but then yeah. track it at the same time. And so it kind of blends a little bit of business coaching with a lot of uh, cognitive psychology and habit renewal habits. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. I love that too. So I, I bring that back full circle guys to selling on Amazon, being an Amazon FBA seller, which is what we teach in our course. Um, and, you know, I run a course in a mastermind. Kelly's been in it um, for a year, year and a half now. And it's a course where we teach people how to create predictable recurring revenue while you sleep by creating and selling private label products on the Amazon FBA seller platform. Now, here's the interesting thing, guys. Before you thought I was gonna launch into a ad for the course, which I am not, um, what I will do is let you guys know that anybody that contacts me uh, directly on my email, I'm happy to share with you a free one hour course for anything that you wanna sell on Amazon. This is going to be great for you to learn it's a one hour crash course. It is absolutely free for listeners and viewers of this program. Again, you can watch us on YouTube. You can listen to us through Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you like to. But 
the point that I was making earlier is that when people start selling e-commerce, when they start selling on the Amazon platform, they always ask me, oh man, Shaheen, you know, we've watched the course. We love it. We've got all these ideas of products and look at this one's going to make this much money. This one's going to make that much money. Okay. Yeah, that one's okay, but it'll just be easy. But look at all these other ones. I say, no, stop. Go with the easy one. Why? It's the exact same thing you guys are, are teaching right now is that I want them to close that feedback loop. If they're putting energy out into the world and not getting any feedback back in, they're not going to be very excited to continue. And then something's going to come along that's going to give them feedback. Guys, a job, that's feedback. You go into a job, you do the job, you get a check. So you are competing with that dopamine hit of that paycheck. You are competing with the dopamine hit of all this other stuff that you're doing. So to be successful selling online, to hack Amazon, to hack eBay, to hack Etsy, all these platforms, what you have to do, and a lot of the Amazon gurus don't talk about this. A lot of the e-commerce teachers and the, a lot of the Amazon courses don't talk about this, is that you need to have a hit right away. And this is one of the things that makes our course different is that it's a course, it's a mastermind, but we also feed you products. We give you the opportunity to purchase products where all you got to do is buy them, resell them on your Amazon account and make the money. Why do we do this? We do this so you get a quick win. You get that dopamine hit and that excites you to get back into the process. My mm -hmm. little brother who I, I call him little brother, but he's like six, six. Um, mm -hmm. he, he just started selling on Amazon. He quit his job as a teacher and just started selling on Amazon. And the first thing that he did is he shot over to the local, you know, dollar store and he found all these things that are a dollar at the dollar store, but sell for 10, 12 bucks. And he called me up saying, that's a 10 or 12 time markup. Is it possible to really make that money? And I said, give it a shot. And he did it and immediately he found out, oh man, I just sold 40 things, right? Maybe you didn't make that much. You made 400, 500 bucks or something profit I was after all was done, but it was an immediate hit. It was an immediate hit of dopamine, just like you guys are saying. So I think what I'm taking in conclusion to all of this, what I'm learning from uh, Dr. Kelly and, and Bart is that we want to do things always where at the end we close the feedback loop and if we can't close the feedback loop we need a hack we need to have a small win so bart if people want to get a hold of you how can they find you and how can they get a hold of your book yeah i just built a website called getbartsbook.com and it's really just a free book you got the audio version of stuff you could obviously go to audible and buy it i'll take your money i like money but I also like giving away free things and, and building our, our subscriber list. And then stop by my Instagram, Bart Baggett, B-A-R-T-B-A-G-G-E-T-T. -E and of course, it's BartBaggett.com. Look forward to connecting with you. I'm open to also having conversations and seeing uh, what kind of content you want on the podcast and how we can serve you. Yeah, please reach out to us, guys. And Dr. Kelly, if somebody wants to find you, do they just walk up behind you and say, hey, buddy? Or what, what would be the best way to get a hold of you? <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's one way. Um, the uh, yeah, they can you can find me at Nola, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Nola Acupuncture dot net. Nola Acupuncture dot net. You can find all that on there. And I also like I didn't mention before, but like telemedicine, I do. I, I teach people regularly meditations in Tai Chi on Zoom, and um, so that's one way they can get me distance. And it's lifeline technique is over the phone or over Zoom also, but um, primarily that's where I am. You can find me that way um, with my uh, bio. I, I mentioned, mentioned this too before. It goes along with your your title, but I call my acupuncture biohackupuncture um, uh, because it's it's a very modern version of it. I use a lot of electricity. It's very unusual, um, and so. Uh, I thought that would go kind of along with your theme, though, the biohackypuncture. Uh, but you can find all that on nolacupuncture.net. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Super talented, guys. I don't know how. I, I've listened to him for an hour now on this podcast. I'm still not sure exactly how he does it, 
But I, I think there might be some like magic in there that he may not be telling us about. And I think we're going to have to twist your arm and get you back on for another episode where we can dig a little deeper there. Guys, if you are interested in selling online and creating predictable recurring revenue streams that never fail, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you. I answer all messages personally. It may take me a little bit to get back to you, but I will. My email is in the show notes. You can also get me on shaheenshayan.com to uh, research my course, my online course and mastermind. You can go to fbasellercourse.com or just go through shaheenshayan.com and click on the link for Amazon course. And of course, you can email me, get me through Insta or any of those other channels. And make sure to listen to my other podcast, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. Guys, this has been a real pleasure. Dr. Kelly, we're both honored to have you on Bard again. Pleasure highlighted my week as well. And we'll see you guys on the next show where I think we're going to have another very special guest that you're not going to want to miss. All right. Let's have a great night. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.